Section five of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Piver de Senancourt. Translated by Arthur Edward Waite, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two biographical and critical introduction by a e wait section five with reference to the specific instance which i have promised to cite that namely of louis claude de saint martin i should like in the first place to say that senancour was a reflective rather than a reading man and had comparatively little book knowledge beyond what had been provided him at the beginning by a classical education a list of the books which he refers to outside any that must have been consulted for his moral and religious traditions or his historical summaries would not be of great length there would be the occult philosopher cornelius agrippa especially the vanity of the arts there would be eckhart's hausen's cloud upon the sanctuary which must i think have impressed him there was of course the imitation no doubt there were some of the works of st augustine i am not of course compiling a list but am citing a few numbers which would enter into it and would be suited to my purpose which is to introduce the one book which must to all appearance have sunk rather deeply into his mind namely st martin the unknown philosopher on the spirit of things senancour had needless to say no tendency to what is commonly understood by occult doctrine i have noted one or two remarks in the meditation which seem to hint at the pre-existence of the soul but they are too dubious too much a mere shadow of thought to bear quotation so far therefore as st martin was a doctrinal philosopher of the occult school so far he has no analogies in senancour but it so happens that st martin great mystic that he was had a very slight burden of inheritance from any schools of initiation and far less than senancour did he ever have recourse to books he had passed through a certain school of experience and it had affected him in specific ways but he was a first-hand thinker in the universe and senancour was like him and having regard to the similarities which i can trace in their disposition their natural trends of thought and the consanguinity of their early vocation towards all that they comprehended by truth justice and order it would perhaps be more surprising if there were no analogies between them than that those analogies are so numerous more especially as thoughts on fundamental subjects are often identical independently of disposition in the thinker some of the analogies are even to be found in obermann the eighty-ninth letter is one of the triumphs of the book with its denial and confession of a great love wedded to a great incapacity it is in one sense the key to the general situation of obermann that situation is of one who does not pretend to live but merely to observe life and this also was the situation of saint martin who tells us in his private memoranda that he had passed by life rather than lived it we may also compare the obermann who affirms that oblivion has become his sole asylum to the second obermann whose tomb still cries eternity be thou my refuge and we shall understand that senancour must have approximated much more closely to him for whom the universe was a great fire lighted since the beginning of all things for the purification of all corrupted beings and who also to illustrate the correspondences analogies and identities with which we are here concerned tells us that all who are instructed in fundamental truths speak the same language for they are inhabitants of the same country if it must be confessed that these thoughts are too remote as regards their form for senancour to have perhaps appreciated or even tolerated them he was not much apart from their essence 
there are many passages in the meditation which might well have been written by saint martin as for example when senancour formulates this aspiration may the sincerity of our views and the purity of our conduct make us worthy to be received among the adepts called gradually to the participation of the mystery without bounds senancour is in specific and in literal agreement with saint martin when he maintains that the principle of our actions and the real object of our desires appear alien to the present law had senancour adduced this doctrine to its full term he might have seen all martinism or all mysticism issuing from it as tree from seed it implies the antenatal state of man and something in the nature of a fall elsewhere fully recognized by senancour and it places man in just that position in the world which although somewhat crass may be best described as askew and which was so fully recognized by saint martin man's claim to immortality is described in terms which are reminiscent of the earlier mystic it is not our part to acquire immortality as a right for we cannot do so but we may obtain certain titles and these are the title deeds of our admission into the future regions which are discussed by saint martin under the grotesque figure of a ticket giving admission to a theatre among other matters over which the two thinkers were in substantial agreement was that within the measure of the system and the capacity of the thoughts of either the doctrine of endless punishment could find no place but the objection to it deeply rooted as it evidently was takes in both rather a tentative and hesitating manner of expression again they are both in agreement about the subject of book-learning of which i have already spoken saint martin anticipated the time when even his own writings would be superfluous because man would be taught of god and the soul senancour founded his objection upon the impossibility of adequate acquisition and thought it better to dispense with what it was impossible to possess thoroughly both were also agreed that true foundations are wanting to human science saint martin went so far as to include mathematics in his impeachment senancour considered that inexact proportions suffice to all our knowledge after a profound contemplation of nature senancour says that the silence of the universe appalls us but he suggests that it is listening to an irresistible voice without which nothing that is would be established after the same profound consideration saint martin tells us that nature is like a dumb being which depicts by motions as best it can the principal wants that consume it but void of speech ever leaves its expression far below its desires and blends ever with its gaiety some serious and melancholy characteristics which are a check on our own joy the peculiar consolation which is ultimately derived by saint martin is not identical with that of senancour but it is very recondite and as it involves a number of considerations which it would be impossible to make clear in a few words we must leave it at this point but for saint martin and senancour alike nature was a copy of the archetype saint martin terms it a portrait of an absent person senancour tells us that the beauties about us are only feeble copies of the incorruptible beauties even in the outward history of the two men there are some interesting affinities and some not less interesting antitheses both in their youth were but feebly attracted by what senancour terms the maxims and the unconsidered tastes of youth i have indicated elsewhere that the same spirit which took senancour to the mountains caused saint martin to lead his hidden life in the cities and even in the highest circles of the world i think it follows from obermann that the inclination of senancour towards the married state had survived his unfortunate experience there is the same disposition in saint martin who never married but what is more curious is this namely 
that those yearnings of obermann which can scarcely be applied to senincourt supplement what is wanting to the rest for the purpose of the comparison which i am making and contain all unconsciously a more specific analogy with st martin there is evidence as i have already said in the case of the latter that he also had a desire for the married state which he only forbore to gratify through the want as he tells us of any divine direction on the subject obermann on the other hand awaited not the direction of the spirit but what he terms the gift of humanity in literary eccentricities they were also alike they both had an inscrutable tendency to make believe that their books were not their own the one plays at editing the other at the mysterious deposition of manuscripts with publishers by unknown strangers finally the one termed himself the unknown philosopher and the other the unknown solitary by way of antithesis between them i may mention the life of st martin at lyons surrounded by fellow mystics and strange schools of initiation yet ever intent on god ever doubtful of aught that hindered his progress in divine knowledge with that life of senancourt or rather of obermann also at lyons and writing from lyons of suicide the points of comparison between obermann and the meditation in no sense exhaust the interest of the latter work for almost every leaf is enriched with beautiful and magical thought it is indeed the one work of senancourt which might lend itself to an anthology of maxims such as m le valois appears to have projected and these maxims would be no slight contribution to the treasury of human thought there are indeed many flowers which as much for their fragrance as their beauty will appeal to those who care to glean in this strange little garden of the soul i have now succeeded in establishing point by point every consideration on the subject of senancourt and his obermann with which i have any personal concern and i should have preferred to fix here the limits of this notice but it is desirable for the sake of completeness to deal shortly with some at least of the other works which have received so far only a bare enumeration the bibliographical history of senancourt is still somewhat obscure and in the early editions he is exceedingly scarce the only work which can be said to have survived him obermann is that which commanded the least circulation in his own day though towards the close of his life it rose into prominence without any assistance from the author a second edition was preparing in eighteen thirty four a date when the third edition of de l'amour had been in print for seven years the order in which his books were published has already been noted and as regards minor productions they can be disposed of in a rapid sketch the variations between the first and second editions of obermann are not nearly so marked or so numerous as between the different editions of his other works which call for serious notice this is to be accounted for by the fact that he was long opposed to its reappearance and those who overruled his opposition seem also to have overruled his desire to retouch in eighteen o nine a note prefixed to the reverie assures us that a second part of obermann will be in no wise published and that the first part of obermann will never be reprinted among others who were instrumental in reversing the latter decision we must doubtless include saint beuve who also provided the preface the publisher designate was m arthur bertrand but he died suddenly while the matter was still under consideration and it appeared in the end under other auspices a note to the second edition refers to the determination stated in the reverie and points out almost superfluously that it was one which could be abandoned without compromising the interests of any one the present translation as it stands will sufficiently apprise the reader that the supplement is added matter peculiar to the second and third editions a portion of the annotations is also wanting in the original and it is significant that among them there is the important note to the eighty-first letter suggesting that obermann would not have rejected the notions of fundamental religion evidently an afterthought prompted by the desire of the writer to save the letters from the charge of implied atheism 
as regards the second part of obermann the statement which i have quoted from the reverie is not as m le valois imagines the sole existing indication that such a sequel was ever contemplated by senancour of which the reader of this translation may satisfy himself by referring to the third note at the end of the present volume in the interval between the publication of the first and second editions of obermann we have seen that parts of that work were transferred to the treatise on love and the later impressions of the reverie as regards the latter work it is impossible to particularize all the interpolations or additions which thus swell the volume entire letters of obermann are sometimes transformed into reverie by the simple method of converting their titles at other times and more frequently excerpts from obermann are introduced into the text at all possible points the work as it originally stood was comparatively of slender proportions and there is no need to say that the method by which it was extended was little calculated to produce harmonious results in a word the majority of readers will be content with so much of the reverie as belongs to obermann and will agree to neglect the rest as to which i need only register a personal opinion that if a collateral survey of its neglected portions were possible in this place it would be by no means devoid of interest it is not however an interest which would tempt us to reverse the judgment of matthew arnold when he said that for english readers at the present day everything written by senancour in addition to obermann is negligible with the exception of the meditation and i can only regret that in this judgment the first-rate importance of the latter for every student of obermann was not more explicitly indicated this general point admitted it remains for me to add that at the same time there are at least two other works of senancour which cannot be dismissed lightly one from the importance of the work and the criticism to which it lays itself open and the other from the comparison which it suggests naturally with obermann before however proceeding to their consideration it would be well to deal shortly with the minor works they fall under two heads for i consider that it is unnecessary to dwell upon the stillborn tragedy of Valambre, while in spite of certain claims to consideration and merit there is nothing in the observations on the genius of christianity or in the vocabulary of simple truths which is likely to be of interest except from the bibliographical standpoint and any curiosity of this kind can be amply satisfied from the work of le valois who has given both of them extended consideration and to whom therefore i refer the heads just mentioned are a historical b political and it is difficult for an impartial observer to find anything of importance in either at the history of rome and at the account of china it is altogether unnecessary to pause it could not be said that they were of special moment even in their own day but they appeared in a popular series and as the publication of the first did not make the other impossible it must be supposed that they were acceptable in an unpretentious and limited manner in any case they are not now otherwise than dull and unreadable and as histories more exploded than pinnock and goldsmith it is a satisfaction to be able to add that i have found it unnecessary to do more than glance at them for the purpose of this introduction they are in truth the hack-work of senancour written for the same reason that he contributed to the mercury of the nineteenth century namely to get bread for himself and his family and they are doubtless that part of the work of their author to which arnold referred when he said that senancour pursued literature with scarcely any recommendation or reputation the historical summary of moral and religious traditions belongs to the same class in fact to the same series we must remember that senancour was an admirer of the forgotten boulanger whose loss at thirty-seven years was lamented in the annotations to obermann though he lived long enough to produce an ambitious treatise on antiquity unveiled and there is ground for believing that the opinions of this work impressed senancour it is excusable for of course volney and dupuis were the admitted exponents of historical religion but the fact will not encourage us to expect any great light or wisdom in senancour's version of the traditions of faith and ethics naturally the work establishes a complete independence of morality in respect of religious belief and it affirms further that it is only in ill-regulated states that the fear of god 
so far from being the beginning of wisdom is even so much as a consecration of the public patience while the reason is not that the notion of deity is either fond or useless for it is on the contrary consoling and true and has in fact a greater part to fulfil than the mere hindering of evil it is not less difficult to reconcile this standpoint or the way in which it is expressed with the meditation of six years earlier at the same time the growth of religion in the soul is made to go hand in hand with the enlightenment of the eyes of the mind m le valois however who has done what he could to rescue the work from oblivion and presents to us what he regards as durable efficacious and essential therein can lend it no higher interest than that which it derives for those who take an interest in senancourt from the prosecution which had occasioned him on the appearance of the second edition in eighteen twenty seven seeing that he escaped its consequences the event in question is merely a startling incident in a somewhat colourless career the prosecution was foolish and unjust but it remains personally regrettable that senancour could find no other and more adequate description of christ than that of a respectable moralist not because any description which he could offer would be of consequence but because it is crass and banal as regards the political pamphlets we have seen already that when senancour through the pressure of necessity had recourse to journalism it was among the liberal journals that he pursued his metier he was not a politician by disposition and even in journals merely political he concerned himself rather with the ethical and religious questions of the day his views upon fundamental questions of polity and sociology would not i conceive entitle him to special consideration we know that he derived from rousseau certain views upon the primitive state of man and the desirability of returning thereto it is not of much moment but it may be fair to add that he is not in these matters a mere echo of his master in any case one consequence was entailed by his views he was opposed of necessity not only to large states but also to large cities the happiness of man as he understood it could be found neither in the great empire nor in the great republic the small town the small canton and the federation of states and towns commended itself to his scheme of things all these facts have been pointed out by m le valois who has taken the pains to set them forth at length and with considerable judgment i mention them as they may interest a few persons but most of us have now realized that the redistribution of governments and peoples is not an anodyne for humanity and there is no need for us to enlarge upon it there is a specimen utopia in the fourteenth letter of obermann which will serve for all his inspirations it is bald and impossible and though on this occasion it was scarcely seriously intended it would be idle to take him seriously when he was most intent upon creating a philosophical commonwealth by means of pen and paper setting aside fundamental questions there are matters of interest in his political pamphlets though their point has now passed away but here it is sufficient to observe that as a partisan of law and order he could be and was no blind admirer of the french revolution as the exponent of primitive simplicity and patriarchal government he was not and could not be dazzled by the conquests of napoleon finally as a representative of the modern spirit his sympathy could scarcely be expected with the policy of louis the eighteenth in whom he regarded it as unpardonable that he had exposed so quickly and so openly the designs of the fourteenth century his estimate of napoleon is sympathetic and exceedingly discriminating and there was a time even when he ventured to express the hope that having shown himself a man of strength he might one day be in a position to prove that he was also a man of exact justice the grave of this and many bolder aspirations lies at waterloo there are some things in this estimate which will recall an earlier estimate of saint martin who had also looked to napoleon and the aspiration in question is equivalent to the aspiration of saint martin when he permitted himself to trust that one day the star of truth and justice would rise over his country and his life we come now to the two works which have been reserved for final consideration one is the treatise on love and the other the romance of isabel we have seen that the first occasioned a newspaper accusation to which senancour replied as he could and we are prepared in advance by obermann to find that the author is capable of sentiment 
the domestic sense and a certain quality of passion but he is deficient in the power of transmutation and at least at the period was devoid of the sense of ecstasy i do not know that de l'amour has ever had any serious literary notice with the exception of the panegyric of le valois nor indeed within a measurable period any discriminating criticism except from michelet and he even can scarcely be said to have given more than a passing judgment the four editions differ considerably from each other and their differences are not unimportant as evidence of the growth of the author's mind i do not pretend to have made such a study of the work as would warrant me in choosing between them or in offering any comparative account of them as regards the second point there would not be in any event an opportunity of analysis in this notice and as regards the first i am content to take on trust and my readers will probably agree with me the conclusion of le valois firstly because derived opinions will serve well enough when there is no consequence of any moment attaching to them and secondly because the writer in question is no unsound guide on a matter the pursuit of which has been to him a labour of love de l'amour is never likely to be translated and would find no public if it were nor do i see anything at this day which would warrant in england at least the endorsement of the very high opinion which is formed of it by m le valois nor indeed following him in anything except his conclusion already mentioned namely that the fourth edition is the best because his exhaustive acquaintance with all entitles him to judge of this point that there is here keen insight and there a page of fine writing in the better sense of the phrase can be admitted readily enough to say that it was a work and one of the favourites of senancour is in fact to state as much but to claim that it has any message to deliver at this day on the subject which it discusses would be to speak idle words for which we might be justly held accountable love is the mutual instrument of communication between man and the divine and no consideration of the instrument which ignores its greatest use is worth dwelling on all love subsisting between man and man is merely a sacramental mystery by which we here signify and prepare for that greater communion which is to come the aberrations excesses and travesties of human love may possess indeed physiological interest but their true significance is lost when love itself is regarded from any lower standpoint than this which i have announced above now all this is an unknown world to senancour from which it follows that he has and could have nothing to impart to us having any valid consequence whatever and i think that people even on a lower plane of thought who would be far from admitting or at least realizing my point of view would find the treatise of senancour very nearly unreadable the one further criticism which it seems necessary to pass on this work is that it is almost wholly utilitarian and i have personally glanced over it seeking in vain for a single truly exalted thought i have found instead that the utilitarian element referred to has made it possible for the author within certain limits to excuse things which from the sacramental standpoint can only be regarded as sacrilege or in other words they are a part of what is mystically understood by the sacraments of lucifer it is one of those works which are absolutely without god in the world and its complete and dolorous inhibition is made further evident by the fact that there is not one single reference in its pages to any divine subject as a more express and intelligible condemnation for the ordinary reader i need only add that it is the production of an almost dispassionate man thy head is clear thy feeling chill says matthew arnold addressing the author of obermann for such a disposition the higher mysteries of lesbos which he speaks of indulgently are not definitely more repellent than le lit conjugal the usage of which he condemns isabel has been sometimes described as the sequel of obermann its missing second part it is nothing of the kind as already explained the true second part and at the same time the antithesis of obermann is the meditation on the other hand isabel connects with obermann as a kind of compliment it is however more of an epistolary story its inferiority has been mentioned by critics in such terms as to suggest that it is worthless but though confessedly somewhat bald it is by no means entirely contemptible for myself i have turned the slight leaves of the meagre octavo with peculiar interest and have noted many evidences of the same melancholy insight 
the same forlorn felicity the same occasional depth the same half-conscious half-instinctive contact with the infinite and eternal which those who know senancour know and admire in obermann in the forty short epistles so full of austere restraint and yet so palpitating there is in fact the seal of obermann the silence of the fields does not always procure peace says isabel but it makes us realize more fully the need of it is not that the sentiment of obermann and the mood of obermann it might be almost an excerpt from his own letters set free from the twofold yoke of the passions and of custom we cling only to imperishable truth is that not the same point of view the same concealed and scarcely expectant aspiration shall i not assume in this beautiful universe something of nobler attitude in one way and another was not that throughout a part of the self-questioning of obermann and again we exact too much and are unreasonable for we ask to be happy is not that the sad cynicism of obermann and yet again to live in contentment and yet retired our individual vigorous movement must animate that universe which unceasingly fulfils its own in a kind of chilling and silent immobility given obermann's standpoint and admitting and passing over the intentional contradiction in the terms of the statement while it recalls many sayings of obermann it does not recall any that are better said or more suggestive in their own degree and to recur to an analogy which i have already instituted there is precisely the same vein of sentiment in isabel which enabled us to compare obermann to the romances of mrs ratcliffe if obermann is the valancourt of the mysteries of udolpho isabel is its emily and one may faintly marvel as to what would be the consequence of their nuptials after as many adventures and mysteries of the soul as these characters experienced in the castle of the apennines isabel is not certainly great it may even be that it is not remarkable but it is exceedingly natural and it shows great insight into certain phases of womanly character it has also several memorable passages as for example if retirement does not become to us as an asylum it deprives us of all other the date of publication is subsequent to the first edition of the free meditations yet many years seem to divide it from that admirable work it is of the period of obermann and the earlier reverie but with a certain vague suggestion of a little further progress there is a dim and hesitating tendency to recognize religion and a field for its operation it is not perhaps necessary to say that religion itself is misunderstood that there is assumed to be an advance in religious notions when the ethical part of religion comes prominently into the mind to the exclusion not only of what is understood to be superstition but also of doctrine and ceremonial as to these points senancour is more deeply wrong because he is partially right morals bear the same foundation to religion that a concrete foundation and a damp course may be held to bear to a house so also ceremonial is not religion any more than a scaffolding is a house but scaffolding is not unserviceable in the course of house-making doctrine again is not religion any more than the ground plan is the house itself yet the ground plan is not unhelpful to a scheme of architecture i have now passed in review as fully as these limits permit all the memorials bequeathed to us by the author of obermann those which have the elements of permanence are the notebooks of his soul in various stages of growth though we can trace in all a congenital intellectual limitation which cut him off from the greater spiritual experiences those readers for whom i have written here and have translated the pages which follow will i believe confess with me that we communicate in senancour with an experience which is real of its kind and is within its own range remarkable the pessimist has passed into an optimist in the better sense of the expression and the naturalist into a mystic too often for such variations to have in themselves any strange aspect but the conversion in the case of senancour had special characteristics of its own which set it to some extent apart and the records of his inward life are an interesting study and admirable as an object lesson between obermann and the meditation there was assuredly a long pilgrimage of the soul and though it left senancour still far from the end his face was set towards the everlasting salem and amidst much which is sad in his history and amidst much which destroys illusion 
we can still stand in spirit over his tomb at st cloud and in no uncertain manner assure ourselves that eternity has become indeed his refuge a e wait end of section five Section six of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by Etienne Piver de Senancourt. Translated by Arthur Edward Waite, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two prefatory observations by the author it will be seen that these letters are the self-expression of a man who feels and not of a man who acts memoirs of this kind are outside all concern of the uninitiated but it is possible that they may interest the adepts some of these will regard with interest what has been experienced by one of their fraternity with others there has been kindred experience and one has come forward to describe it or at least to attempt its description the writer however must be judged by his life as a whole and not by his earlier years by his entire correspondence and not by an isolated passage of a venturesome or romanesque kind letters of this class which are devoid of art or intrigue must unavoidably meet with small favour outside the scattered and arcane association to which the writer has been affiliated by nature the personalities which compose it are for the most part unknown the species of private memorial which is thus bequeathed them by one of their kindred can reach them only through public channels and that at the risk of wearying a considerable number of grave instructed and even amiable people the editor's duty may be limited to a word of warning that neither genius nor science are to be found herein that this is not to be regarded as a work and that possibly it may even be said that it is not a reasonable book there are numerous productions in which human nature is sketched by a few broad lines if notwithstanding these prolix epistles could make a single man known almost in his completeness they might well be both fresh and useful they are far from fulfilling even such a restricted purpose but if they do not in any sense contain all that might be expected they at least comprise a part and this is enough to justify them these letters are not a romance there is no dramatic movement there are no events preconcerted and led up to and there is no catastrophe there is nothing in the collection which is generally understood by interest nothing of that progressive sequence of those episodes of that stimulus to curiosity which are the magic of many good books and the trickery of many others at the same time there are descriptions to be found herein but they are those which make for the understanding of natural things affording lights perhaps too often neglected on the correspondence between man and that which he calls inanimate the passions are also represented but they are those of a man who was born to receive what they promise yet to be himself without passion to employ all but have only a single end love will again be discovered but it is love experienced after a manner which perhaps remained to be expressed prolixities have a place also it is not denied them in nature the heart is seldom precise is never a dialectician repetitions will be met with but if things are good why so sedulously avoid reverting to them the repetitions of clarissa the disorder and pretended egotism of montaigne repel none but the merely ingenious reader rousseau was diffuse frequently it would appear that the author of these letters did not shrink from the prolixities and the deviations of an untrammelled style he has written out his thought at full length it is true that rousseau had a right to be somewhat spun out in the present case the use of the same licenses simply because it has seemed to be good and natural 
finally contradictions will be encountered or those at least which are frequently classed as such but why should we be offended at finding over matters which are dubious the for and against brought forward by the same man as it is indispensable to combine both in order to seize their drift to weigh decide and make choice does it not come to the same thing whether they are in one book or in different books as a fact when advanced by one man it is often done with more equal force in a more analogous manner and that which it is advisable to adopt is more clearly seen our affections our desires our very sentiments our opinions even change through the lessons of events the opportunities of reflection with age with all our nature the man who is so utterly in agreement with himself deceives either himself or you he has a system he has taken aside but the man of sincerity says to you my feelings were those once but they are these now here are my materials build for yourself the house of your thought it is not for the frigid man to distinguish the differences of human sensations just as he is unacquainted with their extent so he is unaware of their variety why should diverse points of view be more astonishing at diverse ages of the same man or even at the same moment than they are in different men one observes one seeks but does not however decide would you require that the holder of the scales should first of all find the weight which will ensure the equilibrium everything should be in harmony no doubt in an exact and logical treatise on positive subjects but do you insist that montaigne should be true after the fashion of hume and seneca as regular as bizou i should consider that one must even anticipate no less or greater oppositions between the different ages of the same man than between a number of instructed persons of similar age it is undesirable precisely for this reason that all legislators should be advanced in years unless indeed they are a body of truly chosen men capable of following out their general conceptions and remembrances rather than their present stage of thought the man who is exclusively devoted to the exact sciences has alone no need to fear that he will ever be betrayed by what he wrote in a previous age these letters are not less unequal and irregular in their style than in their subject matter one thing only has attracted me and this is the absence of those hyperbolical and trivial expressions which should ever seem ridiculous or feeble to a man of letters such conventions are either essentially vicious or at least the frequency of their usage by bringing them into false applications has altered their original acceptations and caused their proper value to be forgotten i am not seeking to justify the style of these letters in that case i should have to deal with some methods of expression which may appear hazardous and which nevertheless i have not changed for much of the incorrectness i know of no valid excuse nor can i dissimulate that a critic will find a great deal to reprehend i am not affecting to enrich the public by a laboured performance but to afford for a few persons scattered throughout europe the opportunity of sharing in the sensations the opinions the free and inexact dreams of a man much in isolation who wrote for himself in his solitude and not for his publisher the editor of this work has and will still have only one object in view whatsoever may bear his name will tend to the same purpose whether he writes himself or makes public the works of others he will never swerve aside from the moral aim he does not seek as yet to attain it any important writing designed to be useful by its nature a veritable work such as can be sketched solely but none can pretend to complete should neither be put forth hurriedly nor even undertaken too soon end of section six section seven of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de sanincourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two first year letters one and two letter one geneva july eighth first year twenty days only have passed since i wrote to you from lyons 
i spoke of no new intention for i had formed none and now i have left everything and i am here in a foreign land i am afraid that my letter will not find you at chessel and that hence i shall not hear from you with all the speed that i could wish i am anxious to learn your views or more accurately what they will be when this shall have reached you i leave you to judge of my feelings if i were really in your bad books yet i fear that you may think i deserve it nor am i certain myself that i do not i have not even found time to consult you i could well have wished for an opportunity at so vital a moment i am in doubt to this day how to regard a determination which subverts all schemes planned for my settlement in life which transfers me abruptly into another situation which destines me to things that were entirely unforeseen and of which i cannot so much as anticipate the sequence and the effects there is still more that i am compelled to admit the step which i have taken was it is true as sudden as the determination which prompted it but something more than the want of time has prevented me from writing to you had it been at my disposal i think that you would have been none the wiser i should have been afraid of your caution for once in the world it seemed necessary to throw discretion to the winds a narrow and timorous prudence in those to whom fate had confided me spoiled my first years and i verily believe has wrought me permanent injury the way of wisdom lies between diffidence and temerity the path is difficult wisdom must be our guide so far as her horizon is clear but as to things unknown we have only instinct if the latter be more hazardous than caution at least it accomplishes greater results it either destroys or preserves us at times its rashness proves our sole refuge and its part is happily to repair the calamities which have been brought about by discretion we must either drag the weight of the chain for ever or it must be cast off without pausing to deliberate one or the other seems to me unavoidable if you are of the same mind encourage me by saying so well do you know the galling chain which has just been broken i was required to undertake what it was impossible for me to fulfil properly to embrace a state of life on account of its emolument to dedicate the capacities of my being to that which is essentially repugnant to its nature ought i to have stooped to a momentary compliance to the deception of a kinsman by persuading him to believe that i should adopt permanently what i could have begun only with a longing to abandon and thus live in a condition of embroilment in an unending loathing may he admit my inability to comply and hold me excused may he end by realizing that conditions so diverse and so antagonistic wherein the most contrary dispositions find that which belongs to them cannot be suited indifferently to every temperament that it is insufficient for a way of life which has contending interests and competitions for its object to be reputed honest because one may amass therein without thieving some thirty or forty thousand livres per annum and that in a word i could not forego being a man in order to be a man of business i make no attempt to bias you i state the facts it is for you to judge concerning them as you have yourself remarked a friend's part is to decide without too much partiality had you chanced to be at lyons i should scarcely have formed my resolve before consulting you for then i must have hidden myself away as it was i had merely to remain silent 
as chance itself is invoked to authorize those steps which we conclude to be unavoidable i thought it fortunate that you were away i could never have gone contrary to your opinion but i was not sorry to act without it so conscious was i of all that could be urged by reason against the law which a species of fatality imposed on me against the emotion which carried me away i have followed rather this private but magisterial impulse than cold temptations to calculate and defer which under the guise of caution may perhaps partake largely of my own indolent constitution and of a certain infirmity in performance i have taken the step and i am glad of it but where is the man who can ever feel positive that he has acted wisely as regards the final consequences of things i have been explaining to you why i have failed to adopt the course that was required of me i must now say why i have not done anything else i examined whether i should discard absolutely that calling which i was desired to accept and by this i was led to consider what other i might assume and on what resolution i should fix it was a case of adopting of starting perhaps for life what so many people void of all other inner resources designate as a calling i found none that was not foreign to my nature or opposed to my judgment i questioned my real self i reviewed rapidly all that environed me of my fellow-men i demanded whether they felt as i did of things whether they accorded with my tastes and i found that there was harmony neither between myself and society nor between my wants and the conventions which it has fashioned i paused in dismay conscious that i was about to consign my life to unendurable tedium to mortifications as endless as they would be without object i set before my heart in succession all that men seek in the various occupations which they choose i sought even by the charms of imagination to embellish those manifold designs which they offer to their passions and the visionary aims to which they ordain their years i sought i say but i failed why is earth thus stripped of illusions in my eyes satiety i have in no wise known the void i find everywhere in that day the first which made known to me the nothingness whereby i am encompassed in that day which transformed my life had the leaves of my destiny been placed in my hands to be turned or closed for ever with what apathy should i have surrendered the empty progression of these hours so protracted and yet so fleeting steeped in so much of bitterness and comforted by no true joy as you are aware already it is my ill fortune that i have never been young the long-drawn weariness of my earlier years has seemingly eradicated illusion i am undeceived by the embellishments of external things my half-closed eyes are never dazzled too fixed are never astonished that day of vacillation was at least a day of light it led me to recognize within myself what heretofore i could never discern clearly in the greatest perplexity which i had ever known i enjoyed for the first time the consciousness of my true self pursued even in the mournful repose of my accustomed impassiveness and compelled to be something i became at length myself and in these emotions till then unknown i was conscious of an energy at first constricted and dolorous but with a species of repose in its fullness which till then i had not experienced this agreeable and unexpected condition induced the train of thought which determined me it seemed to offer the explanation of a fact which is one of daily observance that actual disparities of fortune are not the governing occasions of the felicity or misery of men i reflected that the true life of man is within him 
while that which he derives from without is only adventitious and subservient he is immeasurably more influenced by objects in accordance with the circumstances in which they find him than in accordance with their own nature during the whole period of a life which is subject to their unending modifications it is possible for him to become their result but in this ever-shifting series it is he only who abides in spite of change whilst the outward things related to him are transformed entirely it follows that each one of the impresses which they make on him depends far more as concerns his felicity or misfortune on the condition in which it finds him than either on the sensation which it occasions or the change for the time which it effects in him to be that which he ought is thus in each specific moment of his life what is vital above all things to man the advantageous adjustment of his surroundings takes a lower rank it is a benefit of a subordinate grade for any given moment but the succession of these impulsions becomes in their aggregate the true originals of the inward motions of man and hence if each one of such influences be singly almost neutral their sum total does not the less constitute our destiny is everything of equal importance in this round of reciprocal relations and effects is man whose absolute liberty is so dubious and his ostensible liberty so restricted compelled to exercise a constant option demanding an unwavering will ever free and powerful whilst he can control so few events and can so little govern the majority of his own inclinations is it essential for the peace of his life that he should foresee all should direct all and determine everything with so much solicitude that even if successful invariably it must still be the torment of that life should it be equally essential to control these two motions with their uniformly mutual operation but if this notwithstanding should exceed the powers of man and if the very effort necessary to produce it be diametrically contrary to the ease which is anticipated therefrom how can we most closely approximate to this result while renouncing the impracticable means which at first sight seemed alone capable of ensuring it the solution of this problem would be the grand achievement of human wisdom and the prime object which could be offered to that inward law which impels us to seek for happiness to this enigma i thought that i had found an elucidation corresponding to my present needs perhaps they helped to my acceptance of it i considered that the first condition of things was most vital of all in this oscillation which is reacting incessantly and in consequence invariably draws less or more from that first estate i reflected let us before all be that which becomes us let us take up that position which suits our nature and then give way to the current of events striving only to be preserved in conformity with ourselves thus whatever may bechance free from all alien anxieties we shall determine outward things not by their transformation in themselves which to us matters little but by ruling their influence upon us which is alone of consequence is the most easy to accomplish and does more to maintain our being by restricting and returning upon itself the conserving effort whatsoever be the effect which is produced on us by that absolute influence of things which is not to be changed by us we retain always in the last resource much of the impulse that was originally imparted and thereby we approximate more than we could otherwise hope for to the happy perseverance of the wise so soon as man begins to reflect from the moment that he ceases to be borne away by the first appetite and the unconsidered laws of instinct 
all equity and morality become to some extent a question of casting up and caution consists in the calculation of the greater or the less i thought that i could discern in my conclusion as clear a result as that which follows a procedure with numbers since i am giving you an account of my intentions and not of my mind and am far less concerned in justifying my decision than in indicating how i reached it i shall not attempt to render a better account of my reckoning in conformity with this point of view i abandon the remote and manifold anxieties of the future which are always so exhausting and often so vain once and for all life i devote myself solely to the disposition both of myself and of outward things i do not in any sense dissemble how far this work is likely to remain incomplete or how much i may be deflected by circumstances but i shall at least do all that is in my power i have deemed it necessary to change things before changing myself this initial enterprise may well be achieved more quickly than the second and it was not in accordance with my old way of life to be concerned seriously about myself the alternative of the crucial moment in which i found myself drove me to ponder first of all over external alterations it is in the exemption from outward influences as in the silence of the passions that it is possible to examine our ourselves i seek a refuge among these still mountain places which in their distant view impressed my early years i have no notion where i shall halt but write to me at lausanne letter two lausanne july nine one it was night when i reached geneva and i took up my quarters in a none too cheerful hostel where my windows opened on a courtyard the arrangement did not displease me on my entrance into so glorious a country i deferred willingly the kind of surprise which is attendant on a novel pageant wishing to enjoy it in its fullness instead of reducing its effect by a gradual experience i kept it for the brightest hour of the morning on leaving geneva i set forward solitary free devoid of precise end with no other guide than a passable map which i carry about me i was starting on my independent life i was about to take up my abode in perhaps the one country of europe where in a climate of moderate clemency the scenic wildness of natural situations may still be found soothed by the very effect of that energy which had been aroused by the conditions of my exodus satisfied in the possession of my true nature for the first time in the course of my nugatory days looking for simple and sublime enjoyments with the eagerness of a youthful heart and that sensibility the fruit at once bitter and precious of my prolonged weariness i was fervid and yet tranquil i was happy under the shining sky of geneva when the sun soaring above the lofty snows unfolded before me this matchless region it was in the vicinity of copay that i beheld the dawn not in barren beauty as i had seen it times out of number but invested with a loveliness so grand and exalted that the veil of illusion fell once more before my dejected eyes you are unacquainted with this country which according to tavernier can be compared only with a single place in the east you can form no exact notion concerning it the majestic effects of nature can never be pictured as they are had i less realized the augustness and accordance of the whole had not the translucent air invested it with an aspect which words fail to portray had i been other than i am i might attempt to bring before you these snow-bound and flaming pinnacles these clouded vales these black scarps of the savoy slopes the hills of vaux and the lesser jura 
perhaps too beaming but overshadowed by the alps of gruyere and ormont and the vast waters of le mans and all the movement of its waves and all its measured serenity possibly my inward state added lustre to these places no man perhaps has experienced in their presence all that was felt by me it is the faculty of far-reaching sensibility to derive more intense delight from its own impressions than from positive enjoyments the latter make known their limits but those which promise this sentiment of an illimitable power are vast like it and seem to body forth that unknown world which we are for ever seeking i should hesitate to affirm that the man whose heart has been lacerated by habitual sufferings may not be endowed by his very wretchedness with a capacity for pleasures which are unknown to the happy and possess over theirs the advantage of a greater independence and a permanence which supports even old age for myself in this moment which needed only another heart to beat in unison with my own i experienced how much one hour of life outvalues a year of existence how relative is all within us and without us and how our misfortunes are consequent in the main on our misplacement in the order of things the high road from geneva to lausanne is pleasant throughout for the most part it follows the shores of the lake and it led me towards the mountains i had no thought of leaving it nor did i pause till approaching lausanne on a slope with the town out of sight i awaited the close of day the evenings are unpleasant at the inns except when the fire and the twilight help out the time till supper when the days are long this tiresome hour can be avoided only by eschewing travelling during the heat which is just what i fail to do since my time at foray it has been my habit to journey afoot when the country is attractive and once i am on the way a species of impetuosity forbids my pausing till i am almost at the end of my excursion conveyances are essential to carry one quickly along the dusty highway and the rutted and miry tracks over the plains but enfranchised from business and abroad in the real country i see no need to travel by post and one is shackled too much by taking one's own horses i confess that an arrival on foot is not just at first so well received at the inns but it is only a matter of moments for a host who knows his business to distinguish some dust on the shoes from a pack on the shoulders and that there is sufficient prospect of emolument to make him uncover with a due air of respect you will soon find the servants inquiring much as they would do to any one has the gentleman given his orders i was under the pines of jura the evening was enchanting the woods were still the air was placid the summit softened but not clouded all seemed stationary illumined statuesque and even as i raised up my eyes long fastened on the moss where i reclined i experienced an august fantasy which was prolonged by my musing mood the steep slope stretching downwards to the lake was hidden from me by the rising ground on which i sat and the surface of the lake as if sloping steeply seemed to lift up its opposite bank in the air mists partly invested the savoy alps which appeared to merge into them and to be draped in the same hues the glow of the setting sun and the vacant space of air in the depth of valet exalted these mountains isolating them from earth by screening their base and their vastness void of conformation or complexion obscure and snow-clad was imaged forth as a concourse of tempestuous clouds hanging out in space there was no longer any earth save that which held me up over vacancy alone in the midst of the illimitable such a moment befitted the first day of a new life 
i shall know few like it it was my intention to finish by chatting to you quite at my ease but sleep is weighing alike on hand and head these memories or the luxury of imparting them can stave it off no longer and i will abandon thus feebly translating what i have felt so keenly hard by nayon i had an unclouded view of mont blanc from its apparent foundations upward but the time was by no means propitious it was badly lighted end of section seven section eight of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne pivert de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two first year letters three and four letter three Cali, july eleven one i have little ambition to scour switzerland in the capacity of a tourist or curiosity seeker it is my wish to be here because i feel that i should not be at my ease elsewhere this is the one country bordering on my own which affords speaking generally some of those things that i need in what direction i shall turn i am still undecided knowing nobody and having ties of no kind herein my choice can be ruled only by considerations borrowed from the nature of the localities in those which i should prefer the swiss climate is an impediment i shall require some settled retreat for the winter season and this is the first point that i must determine but long winters characterize these high regions i was told at lausanne here is the choicest part of switzerland and that which is preferred by all foreigners you have seen geneva and the shores of the lake you have still to see iverdun neufchatel and berne local also is usually visited being famous for its industrial art as for the rest of the country it is altogether wild one gets over the english passion for exhausting and imperilling oneself in order to contemplate ice and sketch waterfalls fix your quarters here the pays de vaux is the only region which is suited to a foreigner and in the pays de vaux there is only lausanne above all for a frenchman i gave them my full assurance that i should not select lausanne and they regarded me as highly ill-advised in the pays de vaux there are conspicuous beauties but i am convinced beforehand that as regards its greater portion it is one of those places which i shall least care for in switzerland the country and the people are pretty much the same as elsewhere and i am in search of other manners and a new nature if i were acquainted with german i think it possible that i might go to lucerne but french is understood only in a third part of switzerland and this third is exactly the most vivacious and the least removed from french customs all of which things occasion me profound indecision i have very nearly determined to see the shores of neufchatel and the bas valais after which i might turn towards schwitz or into the unterwalden notwithstanding the grave obstacle of a language with which i am wholly unfamiliar having noticed a little lake which is called de bray or de bray in the maps and is located at some height in the regions above Cully, i repaired hither with the idea of visiting water-sides that are almost unknown and remote from frequented roads this project i have foregone i fear that the district will prove simply mediocre and that the ways of the country folk so near to lausanne will suit me even less i had intended to cross the lake and yesterday chartered a boat to take me over to the savoy side this design i have also had to relinquish the weather has been bad all day and the surface of the water is still greatly disturbed the storm itself is now over the evening fine 
my windows open on the lake the white spume of the surges is flung from time to time into my room it has even splashed the roof the wind is blowing from the southwest in such a way that it is here exactly that the waves are at their strongest and highest believe me that this motion and these measured sounds impart a strong impetus to the soul had i to come out from ordinary life had i to make my own way in the world and did i feel depressed notwithstanding i should ask only for a quarter of an hour by myself before a storm tossed lake it would scarcely i think be the great things of existence which would not come natural to me i am looking with considerable impatience for the answer which i have asked you to give me and though it cannot reach me as yet i am continually on the point of sending over to lausanne in case they have omitted to forward it beyond doubt it will tell me in no undecided way all that you think sincerely along what lines you forecast the future and whether seeing what i am i have erred in doing that which for many others would have been a very thoughtless course to pursue i have taken your advice upon trifles and my most important resolution independently for all that you will not refuse to give me your opinion which must either depress or encourage me you have already forgotten that in this instance i have made my plans as if i wished to conceal them from you a friend's misdeeds may be present in our thoughts but not in our feelings i congratulate you on having to forgive me a few weaknesses without this i should not have as much pleasure in relying on you my own strength would fail to afford me the palladium of your own i write to you just as i should speak much as one talks to himself sometimes we have nothing to say to one another and yet we feel the need of conversation it is at such times that we gossip most at our ease i know of no walk which is so truly enjoyable as one which is without object when the walk is for the sake of walking looking round without wishing for anything in an unruffled and almost cloudless hour free of business indifferent about time reconnoitring as by chance the wilds and woods of some unknown country the talk runs on mushrooms on deer and on the dry leaves beginning to fall perhaps i turn to you and remark here is a spot which is almost the counterpart of one where my father stopped nearly ten years ago to play a game of quoits with me and where he left his hunting knife which was not to be found next day and then in your turn you tell me just where we crossed the brook is a place which would have pleased my own parent towards the close of his life he would drive a full league from the town into a dense wood where there were rocks and water he would alight from the carriage and sometimes alone sometimes with me for his companion take his seat on a rocky boulder together we would read the lives of the fathers of the desert and he would say to me had i entered a monastery in my youth in obedience to my call from god i should have escaped the disappointments which have been my lot in the world i should not be to-day so infirm and broken yet i should have had no son and in dying should have left nothing behind me on the earth and now he is no more both of them are dead and gone there are men who imagine themselves to be walking in the country when they are proceeding in a straight line down a dusty lane they have dined let us say but they will take a turn just as far as the statue and then go home to backgammon we on the contrary when we were lost in the woods of forez went forward free and at random there was something of solemnity in those memories of a time then already remote which seemed to revisit us amidst the denseness and grandeur of the forest how the soul is enlarged when she meets with things beautiful and at the same time unforeseen i would not have all that is hers prearranged and regulated let the mind be permitted to pursue its quests in a methodical manner and to systematize that which it performs but for the heart it should not toil insist on it producing and it will bring forth nothing cultivation only makes it barren recollect the letters which were written by r to l whom he denominated his friend there was not a little wit in those performances 
but of unconstraint nothing each individually constituted a distinct thesis and turned on a special subject every paragraph contained its own object and its proper thought it was prepared as if for the press like the sections of a didactic treatise we are not i think very likely to follow this example where is our need for wit when friends converse it is to say anything that comes into their heads there is only one feature that i stipulate for on your part let your letters be long give time to your writing so that it may take me time in the reading for myself i shall often furnish the precedent as to their contents i am under no apprehension that which we think and feel we shall say of necessity and is not this just what we should say when people prepare for a gossip are they careful to premise talk about this talk about that divide the subject begin at that point or at this supper came in as i sat down to write and they are lamenting that the fish is cold or will at least be good eating no longer and so farewell it is trout from the rhone they have been singing its praises as if they did not know well enough that i am to eat alone letter four t l july nineteen one i have been on to iverdun i have seen neufchatel bienne and the vicinity i am staying some days at thiel on the frontier of neufchatel and bern at lausanne i took one of those hired coaches which are so common in switzerland i did not fear the tediousness of a conveyance i was too much taken up with my situation my hopes so doubtful the uncertain future the present already useless and the emptiness past all bearing which i find everywhere i am sending you a few lines written at various points on the road at iverdun i rejoice for a moment to feel myself free and amidst scenes so lovely i thought to find a better life among them but i will confess to you that i am not satisfied at Modon, in the heart of the pays de vaux i ask myself should i lead a happy life in these places so extolled and so sought after but a profound weariness drove me onward immediately subsequently i endeavoured to deceive myself by referring this sensation chiefly to a depressing feature of the place moudon is well timbered and scenic but then there is no lake i decided to stay the night at iverdun trusting by its shores to recover that sense of ease intermingled with melancholy which i prefer to gladness the valley is beautiful and the town one of the prettiest in switzerland but notwithstanding the scenery notwithstanding the lake notwithstanding the loveliness of the day i have found iverdun sadder than moudon what manner of surroundings must i have at neufchatel this morning i left iverdun sweet town that it is in other eyes so pleasant but mournful in my own why it was so i do not yet understand altogether i know only that to-day finds me in another frame of mind if i had to defer the choice of a retreat such as i require i would more willingly spin out a whole year at neufchatel than a month at iverdun at st blaise i am back from an excursion in the val de travers there i began to realize more fully what kind of country i am in the shores of the lake of geneva are indisputably fine and yet it seems to me that similar beauties might be found elsewhere and so far as concerns the people it is quite certain that in themselves and that which belongs to them they are similar to those of the plains but this valley hollowed out of the jura has the seal of simplicity and grandeur it is full of wildness and yet of life it is at once calm and romantic and though it has no lake it has impressed me more than did the shores of neufchatel or even of geneva here the land seems to be less under the dominion of man while man himself is less given over to paltry conventions the eye is not so incessantly beset by ploughed fields vineyards and villas the fallacious wealth of so many unfortunate countries but large villages but stone-built houses but quest vanity appellations wit the caustic vein 
whither do empty dreams carry me at every pace the illusion comes and goes one hopes and is discouraged at each step and is in constant mutation in this land so different not only from other places but from itself i go on to the alps at thiel i reached vevey by way of morat and did not propose to make a stay here but yesterday i was struck at my awakening by the most magnificent spectacle which morning can produce in a country the characteristic charm of which is notwithstanding more pastoral than majestic hence i have been led to tarry here for a few days my window remained open all night in accordance with my custom towards four in the morning i was aroused by the brightness of the dawn and by the fragrance of new-mown hay cut during the cool hours in the light of the moon i expected some ordinary scene and stood in amazement for a moment the rains of the solstice had maintained the abundance of water previously accumulated by the wellspring of the snows of jura the space between the lake and thiel was almost completely flooded the highest spots formed insulated pastures in the midst of these plains of water ridged by the cool morning wind far driven by the wind over the half-submerged shore might be seen the waves of the lake she-goats and cows led by their herdsmen drawing rustic sounds from his horn passed at the moment along a tongue of dry land which remained between the flooded plain and thiel stones placed at the most difficult points afforded or continued this kind of natural causeway it was not possible to discern the grazing ground which these tractable beasts were destined to attain and by their tardy and vacillating gait it might be thought that they were making for the lake to be submerged therein the heights of aine and the dense forests of julemont rose from the breast of the waters like an island still wild and uninhabited the mountainous chain of Ouilly skirted the lake on the verge of the horizon towards the south the expanse was prolonged behind the slopes of mont Mireille. and beyond all these objects sixty leagues of ionian ice imposed on the whole country the matchless grandeur of those bold features which constitute the sublime in scenery i took my dinner with the toll-collector who rather pleased my humour he is a man more inclined for smoking and drinking than for rancour scheming and self-torment i seem to tolerate in others some habits which i have no intention of adopting they are a refuge from weariness they help to fill up the time without the trouble of taking thought to fill it they dispense one from many things that are worse and in place of that repose of felicity which is seen on no face they imprint at least that of a sufficing distraction which conciliates all and is opposed only to the acquisitions of the mind i took the key with me in the evening so that i could return late without being troubled as to time the moon had not yet risen and i strayed the length of the green waters of thiel but feeling disposed for continued dreaming and finding in the warmth of the night an excuse for passing the whole of it in the open air i took the road to saint blaise leaving it at a little village named marin which has the lake on the south and descending a steep slope to recline on the sand where the waves broke and expired the air was serene no veil of mist was visible on the lake all things slept some in forgetfulness of their toils others in that of their sorrows the moon rose i tarried a long time and about morning it poured upon the earth and the waters the ineffable sadness of its last glories very grand seemed nature when amidst prolonged meditation there was heard the roll of the waves upon the deserted shore in the calm of a night still glowing and still enlightened by a dying moon indescribable tenderness charm and torture of our empty days vast consciousness of a nature which is everywhere overwhelming and everywhere inscrutable universal passion advanced wisdom voluptuous abandonment all that a mortal heart can hold of deep needs and deep weariness all these did i feel all pass through on that ineffaceable night 
i took an ominous stride towards the age of decadence i consumed ten years of my life happy is the simple man whose heart is for ever young there amidst the repose of the night i questioned my doubtful destiny my perturbed heart and that unimaginable nature which including all things seems notwithstanding to exclude what is sought by me in my yearnings who am i then i asked myself what mournful blending of universal affection and indifference for all ends of actual life does imagination impel me to seek in a fantastic order for objects preferred solely because their visionary substance susceptible of arbitrary mutation assumes in my eyes the specious forms of ideal beauty free from still more fantastic alloy thus observing correspondences in things which can scarcely be said to subsist between them and for ever seeking that which i shall never obtain an alien amidst veritable nature a laughing stock in the midst of men i shall be foredoomed always to vain inclinations and whether in life i follow my own bent or the will of others in extrinsic oppression or in my private constraint i shall have nothing but the eternal torture of an existence which is always repressed and always miserable but the extravagances of an inflamed and inordinate imagination are as much without stability as without control sport of the ebb and flow of his passions and of their headlong and unstemmed fervour such a man will know neither continuity in his tastes nor tranquillity in his heart what should i share in common with him all my tastes are consistent what i love is unaffected and natural i would form only simple habits serene friendships and follow an unvaried life how should my yearnings be disorderly i observe in them only the need the consciousness of harmony and of the fitness of things how should my inclinations be hateful to other men i love only that which the best of them have also loved i seek what all may have what is necessary to the wants of all what would put a period to their wretchedness i seek only the life of the good and my peace in the peace of all true it is that i love nature only but for this very reason i do not by any means love myself exclusively even in my self-love and other men are comprised in that nature which i love the more on account of them a despotic emotion attaches me to all lovable impressions my heart full of itself of humanity and of the primeval harmony of beings has never known personal or fiery passions i love myself but as within nature as in the order that she wills as associated with the man whom she wills as associated with the man whom she begets and in consonance with the totality of things in truth unto this present at least nothing which exists possesses my affection fully an inexpressible emptiness is the unfailing characteristic of my thirsting soul but all that which i love might be earth in its fullness might exist after my own heart without anything being transformed in nature or in man himself excepting the transient contingencies of the social order no not of such is the eccentric man his extravagance has artificial causes there is no connection or harmony in his affections and seeing that the erroneous and the incongruous are in human innovations exclusively all the objects of his distraction are derived from that order of things by which the insensate passions of men are excited and the persistent fermentation of their minds forever agitated in contrary directions for myself i love things which are and i love them as they are i desire not seek not conceive not anything outside of nature far as my thought may go astray and direct itself towards austere or fantastic objects towards things that are remote or extraordinary and conscious only of apathy towards that which is offered ready and at hand that which nature normally produces i aspire to what is refused me 
things strange and rare unlikely circumstances and a romanesque destiny still on the other hand i ask through all my life that alone which nature contains of necessity which men should all possess which alone can occupy our days and satisfy our hearts in a word that which comprises life as i do not need things that are difficult of attainment or are reserved for a few so also i require not things new variable or manifold that which has once pleased will please me permanently what has once sufficed for my wants will answer for them through all time any day like another day which proved a happy one is also happy for me and as the peremptory needs of my nature are always pretty much the same seeking that only which they exact i desire invariably much about the same things supposing that i am contented to-day i shall be the same to-morrow to the year's end and throughout my whole life while if my lot be uniform at the same time my wishes are so simple that they can never fail to be fulfilled the love of power or of riches is scarcely less foreign to my character than our covetousness revenge or hate there is nothing which should estrange others of my kind from me i am a competitor with none of them i can no more be jealous of them than i can hate them i should repudiate that which misleads them reject the opportunity to prevail over them and i do not wish even to transcend them in merit i confide in my natural goodness happy in the fact that i need few efforts to prevent me from doing evil i shall not torture myself unnecessarily and on condition that i am an honest man i shall not assume to be a virtuous one virtue is in itself very considerable but i am so fortunate that it is not indispensable and i shall abandon it to others which is to destroy the sole emulation possible between them and me their virtues are ambitious like their passions they parade them ostentatiously and what they seek by their means is above all the primacy i am not in the lists against them not even for that prize what shall i lose by relinquishing such preeminence in their favour among the qualities which they designate virtues those alone are helpful which are native to the man who is constituted as i find myself to be and as i would willingly believe that every man is originally for the others they are complex arduous imposing arrogant and they in no sense derive immediately from the nature of humanity for which reason i perceive them to be either false or vain and am little desirous to earn the merit thereof as to say the least it is uncertain i do not stand in need of exertion to attain what belongs to my nature and have no wish to expand it so that i may compass what is opposed thereto my reason rejects such a course and gives assurance that for me at least these pretentious virtues would be adulterants and the beginning of perversion the sole effort which is asked of me by the love of what is good is a confirmed watchfulness which never suffers the canons of our counterfeit morality to win entrance into a soul that is too upright to be adorned by them externally and too simple to receive them within it such virtue i owe to myself and such only i enjoin thereon i feel irresistibly that my inclinations are natural it remains only for me to watch myself vigilantly and to turn aside from their general direction every particular impulsion which could intermix therewith to preserve myself ever simple and ever upright in the midst of the everlasting mutations and upheavals which the tyranny of a hazardous condition and the subversions of so many variable things may have in store for me it is my duty whatsoever may befall to abide the same always myself for ever not absolutely as i am in those habits which are opposed to my needs but that which i feel myself to be that which i wish to be that which i am in that inward life which is the sole refuge for my sorrowful affections i will question myself and i will sift myself i will probe this heart which is naturally leal and loving but which so many mortifications may well have already discouraged i will decide what i am 
let me say rather what i ought to be and this state once clearly discerned i will strive to maintain it through my whole life convinced that nothing which is natural to me is either perilous or reprehensible assured that no one is ever good unless he is in accord with his nature and resolved to restrain those of my inclinations alone which tend to falsify my original disposition i have known the zeal of arduous virtues in my arrogant misconception i thought to substitute this equally illusory motive for the elusive motives of social life with impassive stability i braved misfortune as i braved the passions and i was convinced that i should be the happiest of men if i became the most virtuous the deception lasted in its full force for nearly a month but a single incident dispelled it then all the bitterness of a faded and fugitive life flowed down to fill my soul in the dereliction of the last juggle which imposed on it since that moment i make no pretence to employ my life i seek only to fill it i no longer desire to enjoy but merely to suffer it i do not exact that it should be virtuous but only that it should never be culpable and this even where shall i hope for it where secure it where shall i find those spacious natural well-used regular days where be insured against misfortune no more than this i desire but what a destiny is that where sorrows abide where joys are found no more some tranquil days will perchance be afforded me but no more days of enchantment days of ecstasy never a space of pure delight never and i am not yet twenty-one years of age and i came into the world sensitive sanguine and i have never known enjoyment and after death nothing left in life nothing in nature i did not weep i possess no longer the gift of tears i feel that i have become congealed i rose i walked and activity was serviceable to me insensibly i recurred to my first quest how shall i regulate myself can i do so and what surroundings shall i select how in the midst of men can it be possible to live otherwise than they yet how be remote from them on this earth which they exhaust to its remotest corners even that which money cannot purchase is only insured by money and thereby alone can that which it procures be avoided the fortune which i might attain is wasting that which i have is precarious my absence perhaps will consummate the loss of all and i am not of the kind to carve out for myself a new destiny as to all this however i believe that things must be permitted to take their course my situation depends on conditions which are yet remote as to consequences it does not by any means follow that even at the expense of the present i could secure the means of disposing at my will of the future i shall wait i will give no ear to an unprofitable prudence which would devote me afresh to that weariness that has passed beyond bearing but here and now it is impossible for me to arrange for always and to assume a defined position or an invariable way of life i must needs procrastinate it may be for long to come and so slips life away still must some years be surrendered to the freaks of destiny to the concatenation of circumstances to counterfeit expediency i am about to live as by chance devoid of any definite scheme waiting for that moment when i shall be able to pursue the plan which alone befits me happy shall i be if in the time which i renounce i succeed in preparing a better one if i can select for my future life its localities its way its customs if i can govern my inclinations restrain myself keep back in detachment and within the bounds of a fortuitous compulsion this eager and simple heart to which nothing will be granted if i can school it to find nourishment in its deprivation to repose in the void to keep at peace in this hateful silence to subsist amidst the dumbness of nature you who know and you who understand me but happier and wiser give way without impatience to the conventions of life you comprehend what in me amidst the estrangement in which we are doomed to live are the needs which cannot be satisfied there is one thing at least to comfort me 
that i possess you here at least is a sentiment which will not pass away but as we have invariably agreed it is indispensable that my friend should feel in unison with myself that our lot should be one that our life should elapse together how often have i lamented that we do not stand thus in relation to each other with whom could an unconditional familiarity be so sweet or so natural for me have you not been to me heretofore my second nature you recall that admirable dictum est aliquid sacri in antiquis necessitudinibus i regret that it was not uttered by epicurus or even by leontius rather than by an orator you are the support upon which i love to lean amidst the inquietude which misguides me whither i love to return when i have ransacked everything and find that i am alone in the world could we live together could we be sufficient to one another then should i cease my wanderings then enter into rest i should achieve something on earth and real life would begin for me but i must needs wait i must needs quest i must press on towards the unknown and all unconscious whither i am speeding flee away from the present as if i had something to expect from the future you forgive my retirement you justify it even and notwithstanding lenient as you are to strangers you do not forget that friendship exacts more stringent justice you are right it should by the force of circumstances i look only with a species of indignation on that egregious existence which i have left but i do not deceive myself as to that which awaits me i enter with dismay upon years full of incertitude and draw sinister auguries from the impenetrable cloud which broods in front of me End of section eight.